Hey everybody, Robert Breaker here, and I wanted to introduce you to John Dislin, and I wanted you to actually see how tall he is. He's seven foot tall, and when I first met him, I said, hey, can you show me your fingers? Because I want to know if you have six fingers or five fingers. And sure enough, how many fingers do you have? I have five fingers, five fingers. Robert. So you're not a Nephilim. Not a Nephilim. Okay, explain to them how the Indians, what you told me about the Indians. Yeah, and so so we all know from the old Westerns and whatnot that the Indian walks up and he's meeting a stranger and he says, how? And so they would hold their hands up so that the party that they're meeting would see that they were not polluted blood. They weren't a half breed. They were human because they had five fingers. And so they would, they would display their, their hand as proof of their humanity, frankly. Because the, the giants ruled the land. The giants populated the land in North America around the world with six fingers and actually six toes and double rows of teeth and red hair and, and all sorts of features. But the six fingers were a dead giveaway uh, and they were here in North America. There's all yeah. kinds of, of uh, artifacts and uh, monoliths and whatnot across right. the country. Mounds. Steve Mounds. Quayle's yep. book, his first one on giants, explains all that. Yep. And you know Steve Quayle too, so I thought that was cool. But talking about giants, I mean, look at the size <laughs> difference between us. And I thought I was moderately tall person, but no, no. But man, it's amazing. It's all relative. It's all relative. It? Yeah. Yes, sir. All right, I'm Robert Breaker, and I've got a special guest today, John Dislin, who is an author slash, what else are you, John? Father, believer, striving to live out this 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 life the, so, as faithfully as I can. Fellow sufferer, right? Yeah. Fellow long sufferer. So sojourner. John, sojourner. There we go, pilgrim. So uh, John contacted me. How long has it been? Uh, Four or five months. And uh, got together, and John wrote a book. And I got this book in the mail, and I'm thinking, well, what is this all about? And the title at first was like, huh? Because <laughs> I'm like, why Nehemiah? That's Old Testament. It's strong? Yeah, well, yeah. Life-sustaining essentials for a season of trial. I'm like, well, we're definitely there. And life-sustaining essentials, that sounds like an interesting thing. So I set it aside for a little bit, and then I guess you emailed or something. And I said, well, I'm going to go read it. And I read it through like in an hour or two. Just I couldn't put it down. There's so many good things. Wow. A lot of it is all about things we're going through now. A lot of it is preparing for things that we're going to go through in the future. A lot of it is just basic common sense. So mm -hmm. I enjoyed this book and I thought I'd do an interview so people could see who you are and also so know more about your book. And you came over a month or two ago mm -hmm. and we had lunch and I enjoyed that. We had a, a long talk and yeah. uh, you showed me your heart. And I thought that was amazing. So I thought, well, we need to have an interview. We need to talk about this. But I'd like to start out with some Bible verses, if you can, because the Absolutely. theme here is being strong. Because there's so many weak people today. Weak is as in anemic, health-wise, but weak is in spiritual as well. And mm -hmm. that's what's kind of sad. So we're going to get into a lot of things here in a second. But if I can, let me go ahead and read uh, Romans chapter 15 and verse 1 through 7. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Mm. So if we're strong, we need to help others become strong as well mm -hmm. and uh, not be weak and make others weak. That's part of a good leader is being able to make others strong. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. Well, that's hard, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes we don't like our neighbors too much, but we're supposed to edify. And I truly believe that this book was very edifying. I was like, wow, there's a lot of good things that, that I knew Sometimes I think I'm the only guy that knew this, but it was kind mm -hmm. of surprising and delightful to find out there's other people like me that know this. And by the way, let me just say here from the beginning, some of the people here in the back that are endorse your book, Steve Quayle, his book on giants was amazing. Uh, I've heard of Doug Hagman and Dave Hodges and some of these other people. I'm so busy, I don't really have time to watch other people so much. Mm -hmm. But uh, that, was, that was interesting that Steve Quayle, his book on giants was pretty cool. Um, let me continue here. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. And uh, we're living in a world where people are losing hope. Mm. So I think this book was, and I'm going to ask you here in a second, but I think part of your writing this book is try to give hope to people, mm -hmm. which is amazing. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. Part of this world that we live in, people are not like-minded. Mm -hmm. But the more we go through things, the more people are starting to, to think alike, I've noticed. 
because we're all starting to wake up and see exactly what's happening in the world. Before, a lot of people, it's like they've been blinded to what's really happening. Now they're starting to say, oh, uh, we've been duped. This is what they're doing. And so it's interesting. And your book points that out a lot as well. That you may, with one mind and one mouth, glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that's part of what you want to do is glorify the Lord with your mouth, right? Mm -hmm. Amen. Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now let's go to Proverbs 22, 3, and then I'm going to let you talk. I want to hear what okay. you have to say, but I just want to start out with some verses. Good to edifying here. That's Proverbs little... chapter 22. Um, sometimes I feel as a preacher, that uh, as a dispensationalist, that I'm teaching and preaching to two separate dispensations. Because as soon as the rapture comes, all my videos are left behind and people mm -hmm. are going to go watch them. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I have this feeling of I'm preaching today, but I know someday I'll be preaching to people later mm -hmm. and I won't even be here. So I find that interesting. And this is a verse that I really like in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 3. And this is a verse that just keeps coming back to my mind. And especially when I read your book, I thought of this verse right here. Proverbs 22, 3. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself. I'm sure you'd agree there's a lot of evil mm -hmm. that we're seeing, and it's getting bigger and bigger and worse and worse. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Mm -hmm. A lot of simple-minded people out there, I don't know if they see it. Maybe they do see, but they just, ah, it's no big deal. And they're about to go through some horrible things because they're not seeing what's really happening. So one of the reasons I wanted to have you here in interview is this book really explains a lot of the evil that's happening, but also some ways to prepare for that as well. So tell us who you are and uh, tell us why the title of the book and why the book, what made you write it? Sure, Good. so uh, name's John Dislin. I uh, grew up here in the South in Tennessee, had a, kind of a regular sort of life for <laughs> up till about 2014, 2015, uh, a career in, in finance and, uh, and then uh, became an entrepreneur and started a, an internet based company for about a decade. Mm -hmm. And, um, but toward the end of that period, God really started working on my heart. And so the, the, the first part of it was uh, as a, as a prodigal son type believer, I, I, I knew the truth, but I wandered away. And, um, and in that season of 2014, 2015, God had had about enough of my wandering and really reached a crossroads in my life. And I'm so thankful that I did because I, I'd always known the truth, but, but sinning was fun. And, and so this, this hypocritical life that I led reached a point where there was enough of it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so God turned me around and, um, just really acquired a passion for him and being faithful to him and, and answering whatever call he might have on my life. I was like, you know, here I am, Lord, send me. Uh, and I, I had no idea <laughs> it was going to be this, but, but started with that. And so from that point, uh, it actually reminds me a little bit of, of Gideon's walk because you know how, first of all, he made a little cake and then he slaughtered his dad's second bull and then he tore down the, the, the altar to the demon gods and then he raised the army. And so, so he, he, he built up in stages. And so uh, shortly after I was born again, I was really convicted about um, uh, the issue of uh, choice versus life. Mm -hmm. And uh, without going into too much detail about the, the specifics of that, I felt compelled to enter that spiritual battle because that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And so I spent a couple of years fighting against um, those decisions that, you know, cost the lives of our most precious, most defenseless mm -hmm. neighbors. Um, from there, I got involved with a gentleman named Russ Dizdar, who uh, was a lovely man of God, loved the Lord, but, and, and had gotten involved in uh, counter human trafficking and uh, spiritual warfare, satanic ritual abuse, really frontline spiritual warfare stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, got pulled into that and that was really an eye-opener in terms of did he know ted gunderson that guy who fought against that as well or no? yeah i don't think so okay. all right i don't know he 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 passed away about a year ago okay um i, I wish i could ask him that question i know who i know who you're talking about mm -hmm. i never met him but i've seen a lot of his work and so uh anyway so i was involved with russ for a couple of years against 
human trafficking, satanic ritual abuse, multi-generational trafficking of young girls and just really heavy duty frontline stuff mm. really uh, was powerful to me in terms of pulling back the veil and just showing almost like Ezekiel chapter eight, when the Lord takes Ezekiel and he shows him the sin going on in the, in the temple. And he mm. says, no, it gets worse. Here's this. No, mm. it gets worse. Here's this. Right. And, and that season was kind of like that. It's you almost like your hair gets blown back. Because as a sheep, you don't you don't think like a wolf. Mm -hmm. But to learn that there are wolves in the world, and to to be confronted with the 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 depth of that evil, and how desperately some people need other people to stand up for them. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you, it's safe to say you went down the rabbit hole, and you saw worse things than you thought were down there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. It, it's it's just as a walking around American uh, or Western. You know, believer uh, who you know understands your Bible, but but there's a, a depth to the depravity that's really hard to to comprehend when you're a sheep, so to speak. A lot of to people, think like a wolf, a to see people, the world like a wolf. A lot of people out of sight, out of mind, so it must not exist because I don't see it. Mm -hmm. Like we read, you know, the prudent man foreseeth the evil. Mm -hmm. So you're pretty prudent. Is that correct? You're a prudent man because you saw it. <laughs> well, and, and that's the thing. That's a great point, Robert. Because once you've seen it. You can't unsee it, and you right. you know it's true. You mm -hmm. you know these poor children are being harmed. Just things I can't even I can't even say. Mm -hmm. uh, I won't say because they're they're so it's it's so horrible that it shouldn't be uttered mm -hmm. in a sense. And so, um, but it's real, and it it, it wakes you up, and uh, at least it did for me. And and uh, and in that season, I really reached a point of like, Lord, you know, what can I do? to uh, encourage your people, exhort your people, wake your people up, encourage them, but equip them with principles and understanding, knowledge, and um, uh, a lot of scripture-based stuff and spiritual warfare-related stuff, but also very practical stuff of mm -hmm. uh, you know, what, what happens in these different situations. How can we carry the day um, when evil comes in like a flood? Mm -hmm. and, and man, is it coming in like a flood? As sure. I think I think we all know at this point. Sure. It's interesting you said awakened. Because the Bible says, awake thou that sleepeth. Mm -hmm. The world says, get woke. Mm -hmm. But the Bible says to awake. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to follow the Bible and I'm awake to what's happening in the world. A lot of folks aren't. But we want people to see that um, there is so much evil. And it's about time you opened your eyes and saw it. Yeah. And a lot of people are, are living in a fantasy. They don't see what the world is really like, and they're about to have their minds blown when that fantasy is unveiled. But yeah. again, so lead that to the Nehemiah Strong, the title. Where did the title come from? Sure. So uh, the, what really inspired me to, to start on this work, Robert, was uh, it was actually a little video put together by this lovely woman who loves the Lord named Celeste Solem. And she's a former uh, Homeland Security executive planner. She's been on the other side for years and years. And so she understands the plans, the preparation, the chess pieces been putting in the, being put into place. And, um, and so in a video, there was just a, a little minute or so in it where she said, oh, by the way, people are gonna, gonna come knock on your door and when they do, you should do this and that. And, and then she went on about her business in that video. And when, when she said what she said, it's like my spirit stopped on that. And I said, oh my gosh. And I started thinking about uh, widows, uh, older women, older couples, uh, real young people um, who would be very vulnerable and, and very prone to fear in, in a situation like that where, where people with guns knock on your door and they want you to do something. Mm -hmm. And almost certainly what they want you to do is not in your best interest. And so, the you know, I, I'd felt that kind of call on my spirit before with, um, going against the, the choice versus life matter that I battled against and the satanic ritual thing. And it's so, so God uh, laid it on my heart to really um, have concern about that. And that was the, the genesis of starting the book. Mm -hmm. In terms of the name, Nehemiah, um, in, in the Old Testament, there's a book of Nehemiah. Mm -hmm. And Nehemiah was, as you know, led by the Lord to come back from the king of, I think it was Medo-Persia, come back, lead a second remnant really back to Jerusalem, 
rebuild the wall, rebuild the city, rebuild the, the, uh, the temple. Mm -hmm. And uh, incredibly, the first remnant that came back had done nothing in 20 years. Like nothing, nothing had really gotten rebuilt. They're, they're almost living in ruins. Yeah. And when he came back, obviously, um, the in uh, in Psalm one twenty seven it says, "But the Lord build the house; the builders build in vain." Mm -hmm. So there were a bunch of vain builders for a generation. Mm -hmm. He then sends Nehemiah back. The Lord is in it, and uh, and there's a, a section where they're building, rebuilding the wall for the defense of Jerusalem in chapter four, and it says. Effectively, it says with one hand they had a trowel and were building, and the other hand was on their sword. And so mm -hmm. there was this this dual purpose of being bold in rebuilding and and preparing for uh, a season, preparing to defend their families, and yet there was also this awareness of importance to be immediately available to to defend mm -hmm. against evil. And, um, and that really resonated in my spirit as I strived to prepare the readers of the book to, to be prepared for every, every, uh, every possible outcome that, that I could envision mm -hmm. over the couple of years that I wrote it. It took almost two years right. to write. So it's a book to prepare. And just as Israel went, and well, edifying is building up. That's what I'm mm -hmm. all about. I want to edify people, not tear mm -hmm. down. So build people up, but... Uh, they were building and watching out for attack at the same time. Mm -hmm. So that sounds like what you're talking about is we should edify others, but watch out for the attacks. Yeah. And we're seeing a lot of bad things. One of your main verses is Daniel 11.32. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell us about that verse. Let me go ahead and read it. You say Daniel 11.32b, but I'm just going to read the whole thing. If that's okay. Daniel 11.32. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. Boy, if that's not the world we live in. Flattery, they tell you everything's great, you're so wonderful, and at the same time, they're planning to stab you in the back. Mm -hmm. um, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Mm -hmm. So this is an encouragement for us that are people of God today, Christians, to be strong. Mm -hmm. But uh, tell me more about it. Go ahead. Absolutely. So uh, it's interesting because as I wrote, uh, I, I really felt like, the Lord was working in me, working on me, and giving me richer understanding as I was putting these principles and these pages together, putting all the words to, 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 to the page. And, uh, and, and there are actually two, two verses that I see here with Daniel, that what you just read, 1132b, mm -hmm. the, the second half of it, being the answer to this first one. First scripture being Isaiah 59, okay. 19. Isaiah 59, 19. Okay, keep going. I'll look that up. And uh, also the B part. You can read the whole thing. Okay. <laughs> but uh, in Isaiah 59, it says, um, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall raise up a standard against it. Okay. Isaiah 59, 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west Amen. and His glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against them. Amen. Amen. And so that's a, what people need to understand, that standard, I mean, obviously it has multiple meanings, which I find interesting. Uh, the, the, the standard being, you know, something for us to set our behavior by, our, our posture. The Bible's my standard, but yes. Yeah. Amen. Uh, and I was thinking of Jesus Christ. Right. Um, but standard in, in that context, that is a battlefield picture. And, and when that standard, it's like the standard bearer, the color bearer. It's a flag. Of a regiment, yes. So right. it's a flag, and uh, and in fact, you know, one of God's names is Jehovah Nissi. You know, the Lord who has a banner or a standard, mm -hmm. and so uh, and so in that the the picture that's portrayed by that verse is evil. The enemy is flooding in. It is a flood of evil, mm -hmm. and and God is on the battlefield. He sees it. He's 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 on the battlefield with us. He raises up a standard. This is this is where the battle is. And in in any battlefield context of having a standard, you run to the standard. You run to the attack. You right. you run to the fight. Um, and so there's that that first to me. It's a call. It's a call to confront evil. To to for us. You know it, what a what a what a stupendous honor for us. We get to play a role in 
standing with the Lord, being faithful to the Lord, doing our part, wherever mm -hmm. our place on the battlefield is, right? Not, Lord knows, not everybody should go write a 480-page book. <laughs> but uh, whatever, where, wherever our place is, go to that place, honor God's call of raising that standard. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm utterly convinced, Robert, that, that Daniel's verse in chapter 11 of Daniel is an answer to this call where okay. he says, but they that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Okay. And, and that's a prophetic verse. He's describing people in our season. He's describing people walking around the earth today. Mm -hmm. and, and I want to be counted as one of those. Among those. Right. And I, I want, I want the, the people who follow you, the, the people who listen, to be counted among those people. And, and Being strong and doing exploits. And you found me on, on YouTube and been watching for, for how long? Oh, uh, at least five years. So you've Six, been following years, along for a long time. Yeah. So the book is about preparing for what? EMP pulse, for nuclear war, for communist overthrow, for hurricanes. For, it's just a lot of it is practical stuff for when bad times come. Mm -hmm. But also, So that's the physical, but also the spiritual. And part of it is overreach, you know, when, when people try to force us to do things against mm -hmm. our will, how do mm -hmm. we respond and things like that. So talk a little bit about, about that, if you would. Absolutely. Uh, more about the... Um, well, first of all, let me mention this because uh, God really impressed upon my heart as I started writing this, the importance of encouragement. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and for example, in, uh, in Nehemiah chapter 8, Nehemiah exhorts the people to throw a feast. Mm -hmm. And the people are despondent because they've been through it. I mean, it's, it was hard and their enemies surrounded them. Their enemies uh, 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 um, criticized them, mocked them while they were building it. They, they tried to bring the king against them to stop them. All, all sorts of shenanigans going on. Mm -hmm. And in Nehemiah chapter 8, Nehemiah says, let's throw a feast. They were despondent. And he said, amongst other things, he, he wouldn't let them get off with, no, you don't get to be you know, poor mouthed and feel sorry for yourself and all this. He said, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Nehemiah 8, 10, right? Yeah, I amen. don't remember which verse, but... I believe that's what it is. Okay. But yeah, that's a great verse. Yes. And that's all the devil wants to do is take your joy. Absolutely. If he can take away your joy, then Absolutely. he's won. And so as so. I'm writing this, Robert... I, I, you know, when you write something like this, you 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 sort of become immersed in the heaviness of it, mm -hmm. and and it, there's a heavy message in here, but it's it's also a message of hope, encouragement, overcoming. You know, we're we're to be overcomers, right? Uh, and so, in early on, as I started writing it, God really laid it on my heart to weave a lot of encouragement into uh, what I was writing, and so as you know. Throughout the book, there's just there's scores of really empowering, uplifting uh, verses that are put there to give people encouragement. As I'm talking about heavy subjects, that we are to be more than conquerors. We're to be Hooper Nikos, right? More than conquerors through Christ who saved us. Okay. Yes, it's Nehemiah eight ten. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. So. Woo I got it right. Yes. All right, so <laughs> let's uh, let's talk about some other stuff here now. Okay. You can, really... can I talk a little bit more? Because I just that was a little bit of a prelude to what you just asked. Well, me. sure. Yeah. Okay. We're here to interview okay. you. So okay. Go ahead. I so, want to hear what you have to say. So I, I just wanted to mention that it's it and I actually like your answer to that. Did you find it to be heavy and weighty and burdensome and, and depressing, or did you find it? Well, obviously well, it, it talks about heavy subjects, yeah. but did you find it to be... It, there's a lot of cool stuff in there, like giants. There's a lot of cool, you know, what people might call conspiracy stuff. But it's not. It's uh, it's a lot of truth, and it was an easy read, and there were a lot of links that you can go and look up yourself. You always want to be documented. So mm -hmm. that's what I found about it. But it was a lot of good information, especially for today, mm. with what people are going through with the, we call it the thingy. Yeah. And how there were papers and there were these um, things that you could fill out for your exemptions mm -hmm. and things like that. People, uh, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, mm -hmm. the Bible says. So this is a book to give you a lot of knowledge. And mm -hmm. that's one of the things that was encouraging to me is, um, yeah, we, we need more information. Yeah. The more the better. So yeah. this is good. Thank so go you. ahead. Thank you. Uh, I was, I was going to add that um, 
something that is, I, th- I think it's apparent to all of us, most all of us, but uh, it, I speak to in great detail from both sides of the, of, of the comprehensive waterfront that we're facing, okay, is the spiritual sort of intertwining increasingly, in my opinion, with the physical. And so 50 or 70 years ago, there, there, life was pretty, nor- let's call it normal, for lack of a better term. Okay, sure. let's call that normal. Mm-hmm. Well, today, there's, there's so much aberration to normal. Things aren't normal. You know, like Steve Quayle has said, normal is not going to apply again. Yeah. And, and when Jesus and others use descriptions of the last days as birth pangs, we all know, if you've ever witnessed a birth, it ain't going back. It hurts. Like, it's my coming. It still hurts from when my wife had our baby. And she <laughs> grabbed my arm she had so a good tight. Grip? It's still, sometimes I feel that grit. No, no. Just her strength <laughs> yes. in that moment. She was stronger than me. That's why women have babies and oh, men yeah. don't, because they're, yeah, they're stronger. Speaking about strong. Yeah. But uh, go but ahead. So, so what, it, what has become incredibly apparent to me, and I, I try to relate it in great detail in the book, is we have to be prepared for things happening in this physical realm. So, for example, people come into your property that you didn't invite, and they come under color of law, as the legal phrase would describe it, and they are seeking to get your compliance to do something you probably shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. And there's a wide spectrum of what those things could be, but Mm -hmm. none of them are good. Uh, but then there's also the, the spiritual side of it, you know, so there's the driving of the fear. There's the encroaching, uh, for lack of a better term, I'm just going to describe it as the antichrist spirit. Mm -hmm. You can feel it. You can see it. You can, you can watch events. You can watch, uh, opening ceremonies of sporting events and you see the most godless and frankly, old Testament biblical depictions of what the Israelites would do just prior to God it's, judging it's them. It's pagan ceremonies and witchcraft in your face is what it looks yeah. like. And it's not, for, yeah. for those who are listening that might think, oh, you're taking it too far, you know, that's where you can see the relationship, but you just think that's bunk and it's really just kind of for fun or whatever. I'm here to tell you it is not fun. They are not fooling. And, and you may not, as the viewer, the listener, you may not believe it, but they believe in it, the, the ones who are putting it on. Mm-hmm. And they, they are absolutely bought into uh, and uh, passionate and committed to their, for lack of a better word, satanic doctrine Agenda. and worship and, and sacraments. You know, things like um, this holi- holiday coming up here in a couple of weeks that so many people Halloween. celebrate and they have things all over their houses yeah. and stuff. And I just walk around thinking, you know, you're celebrating death and you're, you're, you're going to get it because it, yeah. it's coming, it's but sad. they're celebrating it early. So, oh, but so the point, just to finish my point is, um, so we have these physical things going on, like people knocking on your door or, you know, let's say another lockdown or whatever it might be. But then you've got these spiritual elements. And what's, I think, imperative for people to understand is you've got to be ready for the physical, but it's all it's all spiritual and it's, and it's driven by spiritual. Yes. Spirit. It starts in the spiritual mm-hmm. and what we're experiencing increasingly is this overflow. I, I picture it like a flood, right? The enemy coming, coming in like a flood, like uh, Isaiah 59. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what's going on today. And so you really have to be rooted and grounded in the spiritual first and foremost, mm-hmm. and right. then understand preparation in the physical you know, a physical application sure. of spiritual preparedness might right. be a, a really good way to put That's it. A good way to say it. And there's a lot in here about both. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, um, the longest section in this long book <laughs> is specifically on spiritual warfare, as you know. Yeah. And it just goes Armor chapter and verse. Everything right. I learned running for several years with Res is Dark, frontline spiritual warfare. And... Um, and God really laid it on my heart to actually add it to the book. It wasn't in the first draft. And I'm reading through the book, and, and it's almost like I could, I could feel the Holy Spirit kind of rolling his eyes at me, saying, hey, buddy, you know, you spent years doing that, and you ta- you, I danced sort of all around the subject in other contexts, in other chapters. 
but why don't you go talk about it specifically? So I actually yeah. took a month, went back, and wrote the longest section of the whole book. Wasn't it you that told warfare. me there's seven of the um, armor of the Lord? Wasn't that you that, because yeah. I had done a video on the armor of the Lord, and I didn't see seven, and you, you pointed out the seventh one. So God always uses the number seven, so the armor of the Lord, there's it, seven. Would of them. he give us an it's incomplete kind of set of armor? Exactly, of and that's He'd in give the book seven. as well, which is kind of fun. So there's your sevens. Yeah. But um, it's like you're saying, what we see is the devil taking over the world. He is the God mm -hmm. of this world, little g. And a lot of what I'm seeing is in order to get into the secret societies, in order to get into those Luciferians, it's an initiation. And it's almost like the initiation is now out in the open. Mm -hmm. They're initiating people through movies. They're initiating people through opening ceremonies of Olympics. And it's, mm -hmm. it's like it's, everyone's being initiated for that. Mm -hmm. And we that are saved, our eyes are open. And we're like, I don't want any part of that. That's mm -hmm. creepy. That's scary. Mm -hmm. And they're changing everything, changing the laws, like it says in Daniel. That's what the mm -hmm. Antichrist. But they're wanting to change even your very being of who you are. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to get into DNA too much, but there is a thing called CRISPR where they can go in and begin to change people's mm -hmm. DNA. I saw something the other day that was very amazing how the um, thing that holds together the DNA, I forget what they are, peptides, or I forget all these, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't like the big words, but they appear in a certain way, and it's what, 10, 4, something. If you use the Hebrew letters, the way that the pattern works, the way God made our DNA, it spells out Yahweh, or, or yod heh vah -Heh, mm -hmm. which is His God. name is written on our so DNA. So a guy paints a painting, he writes his name. Mm -hmm. God created us, and His name is in our DNA. Mm -hmm. But now they have the ability to go in and change your DNA with a certain thing. Mm -hmm. And I've seen how that changes it to where there's a little 666 in there in between. Mm -hmm. Who would be the one that's 666 in the Bible? That's mm -hmm. the devil. Mm -hmm. So he's trying to say, no, 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 I want these people to be like me. Mm -hmm. And that gets us back into the Nephilim. Now, can we see your hand? <laughs> You're not Nephilim, are you? Look inside. The <laughs> You're seven five, five fingers. <laughs> yeah. I got five fingers. You're seven foot tall, though. But yeah. you go into that a little bit here, too, which, of course, is what Steve Quayle is known for. Yeah. He wrote an amazing book on giants, the first one. I don't really like how he edited the second, but the first book. Mm -hmm. And so your book talks a lot about that and um, how it was in the days of Noah. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. What was the problem in the days of Noah? The fallen angels mixed with women. Yep. So they're changing the DNA of people. Yep. And now we're starting to see what many and are And everything saying. else. Well, people yeah. and everything and else. And animals and everything. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing things today that crazy mm -hmm. what they can make and mm -hmm. things like that. So And think about wow. this. For, for, for critics, I, I would imagine most of the people watching this are, are uh, avid fans of Scripture and Jesus and the Word and, and the rightness of the Word reliability of scripture, uh, supremacy of scripture. But uh, consider this, a, a, uh, a fisherman from Galilee as an old man on a prison island mm -hmm. writes about effectively the, the return of the corruption of genetic code mm -hmm. from first century yep. Patmos. The Apostle John. How could he possibly have known that no, if it wasn't divine? He didn't make that up. That he is true. describing 2022 with perfect accuracy yes. from a rock island in the first century, right. you know, off the coast of Turkey. And, and, he, and he's getting it exactly right. And we're seeing if, it if all If you're come wondering, together. if anybody yeah. listening is wondering if scripture is true, you, you explain to me how this old former fisherman on a rock island 2,000 years ago is describing today. Yeah, it must have it, been God. It can't be done. No, God showed him some things. But for God. And just amazing how we're seeing all these things, like in the book of Revelation, something about Euphrates will be dried up so that the kings of the east can come across. Mm -hmm. They're saying Sing now the up. river Euphrates is dried up. I mean, yeah. everything is coming to pass exactly as the Bible yeah. says, and it's all right there. So, But you know what I would incredible. add to that, Robert? Mm -hmm. Because this, this is the kind of thing where I think some people listening could start to get agitated. They could start to get worried. Oh my gosh, you know, Revelation, the apocalypse, and Armageddon, and... But, but, but Jesus said, you know, let not your hearts be troubled. Mm -hmm. He said, when you begin to see all of these things coming to pass, then lift your head and look up for your redemption. Exactly. We're, we're, yep. to be, we're to be at peace in our spirit as the world is falling apart because we're not of this world. Right. You know, we, we've got our eyes on Jesus. We're lifting our heads. We're looking up because we know our Redeemer lives. Right. 
And so we know he's coming back. The Bible says, God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Amen. And so it all depends on how are you looking at it. Um, you can look at it in fear, how bad times are coming, because the book of Revelation tells us the tribulation and the great tribulation. But as a Christian, I'm encouraged because I believe in the rapture. Mm -hmm. I believe that the, the Lord's coming back to take the church out. I don't think he's passing his bride off to somebody else to let her have him first. Mm -hmm. So it's encouraging to me to see these things come to pass, but it's also, there is some sorrow because I'm concerned about people. I want to mm -hmm. see them get saved. I want them to know what the gospel is, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Mm -hmm. I want them to see Romans 3, 25, you know, through faith in his blood. I noticed on your website, by the way, your website is John Dislin, D-Y-S-L-I-N. And I noticed you had down there blood bought. I thought that was good. I was mm -hmm. like, amen. So don't forget the blood. Amen. No. But, <laughs> yeah, don't, but, um, don't be forgetting that. It's, it's great that... Uh, that we're seeing this come to pass, it's exciting, you know, because oh, we're seeing it yeah. all come to pass. But it's also discouraging, too, because we see friends that have died and mm -hmm. people don't know what they died of. Sudden, what is the new thing called? Sudden SADS. adult death syndrome, mm -hmm. SADS. It is sad, you know. And we see the, the, the economy and, and the prices of things going up. And we mm -hmm. see, um, it seems like, just about the time we save up enough to get something, it's twice as much. It's like, oh, we saved all that for nothing. Now we got to save again. And mm -hmm. it's almost like everything's just right outside of your grasp. You know, mm -hmm. the American dream, what happened to it? Mm -hmm. Well, if you come here legally, you got it and they give it to you. But we who grew up here, we can never seem to quite get it. Mm -hmm. And there's just all these things happening and you can go around and be discouraged, you know, like um, that old cartoon Droopy. Remember Droopy? Mm -hmm. He's always walking around, I'm so <laughs> happy. That's how a lot of Christians are nowadays. Yeah. Or you can truly be happy and keep looking up for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Mm -hmm. So um, so your book, can you give us a little um, couple of things in here just to give somebody an idea. Like I, I like the one that's for the uh, questionnaire in <laughs> case some sort of a person comes and claims that they're a public servant. You know you have a right to ask them questions. And I like the yep. little questionnaire. And give us some other things about the book. Sure. Well, I've never heard the questionnaires in here described as little. Oh, well, they're but we long. Can call them they're little, long. if you like. Um, <laughs> yeah. it, yes, and so as you could imagine, since the whole genesis of the book was the knock on the door, the the the, the proverbial knock on the door. Mm -hmm. You know, whether they're they're seeking to give you, let's say, another medical application of something you'd rather not have, whether they're looking. You know, one of the things that bothers me is, and I know this has happened. This has happened in certain jurisdictions. Someone for the, from the health department shows up and says, your child QR coded, scan the QR code in place of a physical menu at a restaurant. And they were, uh, they were, uh, what do you call it when you, um, I can't remember the word, but basically they were there at the same time with someone who tested positive. Oh, so now okay. they've, they've cross referenced you. That's not the right, right term I'm looking for, but they've, 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 uh, Contact traced you. Contact trace. Yeah. Contact trace your 13 year old daughter mm -hmm. to a restaurant where somebody had been and tested positive for COVID. So now we need to take your daughter, you know, because we love her so much. And yeah. we're going to take they your daughter for two weeks. You know, yeah. she's got 30 minutes to pack, 15 minutes to pack. Yeah. That's the kind of thing that's going to be happening to people. Well, see, it's already happened. And the yeah. Bible talks about the seven plagues in the tribulation. So if people think COVID was bad, no, it's no. going to get way worse. That was just a, and so, but yeah, I see what you're a saying. A shadow. This is them trying to be able to take away from you what God gave you. Yeah. God gave us our children. Yeah. But so, so, this so is here's a, the problem for us, though. I think over the years we've allowed ourselves to be uh, put to sleep, mm -hmm. for lack of a better metaphor, and to and and partly through the school systems, which are really indoctrination systems. They're right. not authentic strong, equipping people to be capable citizens or equipping people to be good functional people, at, let's say in a factory. Right. And uh, right. so we're, we've sort of over the generations, we've had it almost taught out of us in terms of our legal rights, our constitutional God-given unalienable right. rights. Right. And so that really, our God-given rights are the foundation of the defense that I, I encourage right. people to consider deploying right. when somebody comes to your house because they come to your house, it's your castle, it's your land. They've got no particular right to be there. Right. And so if you even are going to engage with them, 
it needs to be your rules. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it, your rules, your house. It's like for our kids, right? It goes for these visitors, these unwelcome guests. Mm -hmm. And so um, what I really like, because I'll tell you, it took, as I told you before, it took weeks to put these questionnaires together. I mean, I started from bedrock and I said, what is every last thing you would want to know about that person, uh, their credentials, their background, confirmation on their uh, on their identification, why they're there, what's the legal code for the justification of their, their, them being there? Because mm -hmm. if there isn't a legal code for a public servant to be at your house, they got no business being there because they're that's extra legal at that point. They're 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 there on some other pretense that mm -hmm. isn't grounded in law. Their whole position is supposed to be grounded in law. Mm -hmm. Sure. And then, you know, it goes on from there in terms of really holding their feet. Frankly, it's it's almost like a it's almost like an education session for your visitor to strike the fear of God in them that you understand your rights, you understand the legal danger that they are in by coming to your house under color of law under false pretenses, mm -hmm. and by golly, you know you're going to hold them accountable if they misstep. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, so uh, I think it's one of the most powerful tools in the entire so book. So let's explain real quick. Yeah. This is called a public servant questionnaire. Yeah. And so basically the idea if someone shows up at your house and says they're some sort of a, a public servant, mm -hmm. which means they're supposed to serve us, this is six pages of a questionnaire that you hand them and say, look, I don't know who you are. If you'll fill out this no, questionnaire. you walk them through it question by question. Oh, you walk it through. So you, say, you ask the questions, because, they give you the answers. And you say, so I need this information before I can continue because I need to know you are who you say yeah, you are. I, you don't know them. That's they, interesting. And they might have bought, it may be a really great costume. They bought down at the, yeah. the, the, uh, the Halloween store, mm -hmm. right? Who's to say that badge is real? Who's right. to say that idea is real? I'm, I'm going to find out every little thing. And by the way, and to the point I was just making, uh, there are all kinds of questions here where they have to either affirm or deny these things in terms of your supremacy on your property, um, things like U.S. Code 18, Sections 241, 242, which have to do with deprivation of constitutional rights, where they can go to prison or they, they can, it's a, it's a death penalty hmm. sections. They can be put to death for depriving you of your constitutional rights. Well, you know, that'll they, never happen. They but, need to know that, but, <laughs> but they need to know that you know that. But that's the law. They need to know the law. Yes. And those that claim to be from the law often don't know the if law. If they're there under the law, yeah. then while you're here under the law, let right. me point out some laws to you that could right. really jerk a knot so in your So a child. lot of people are scared to death of that happening. And so rather than being in fear, look at it as, oh, it's an opportunity to educate this person. Mm -hmm. And there was an, a guy named Stuart Crane many years ago. Have you ever heard of Stuart Crane? Mm -hmm. If you get a chance, go to YouTube and look up Stuart Crane, S-T-U-A-R-T, Crane, C-R-A-N-E. He lived in Detroit, Michigan, and he had a hotel for many years. One of the most smartest men. I think he was the dean of a Bible college for a long time. And people would invite him to do talks. And he would just talk. And just all the knowledge that came out of the guy was just, mm. you just wanted to hear every word. He knew history backwards and forwards. And he was always dealing with people from the state that would come and, and they'd want to see these records. They want to see that. He'd say, look, here's a book. If you read that book, and it's only like that thick, it's more like a pamphlet, then you can see any papers you want. And the name of that book was The Law by Frederick Bastiat or Bastier, or however you say it in French. And it's just a thin little book. He wrote it in about 18, no, no, 17... It was founding father's time, so 1770s or something. And it was all about, this is the law, and we're supposed to follow the law. Sometimes evil people change laws for their own benefit, mm -hmm. and they do what's called legal plunder. But mm -hmm. is it legal to plunder you? That's still against the law. So it's an interesting book. If you ever get a chance, get The Law by Frederick Bastiat. And he would give them that, and he'd, they'd come back. And be like, I read that. Wow, that changed my whole outlook on my job. I'm supposed to be here to help you. I was coming here to try to find something on you, to get fines on you. I, no, I'm just trying to help you. And so he changed a lot of the minds of those so-called public mm -hmm. servants who are looking at you as, well, I've already in my mind think you're a bad guy, so I'm coming to find the bad stuff. Mm -hmm. Why don't you come here and say, how can I help you? And if you find something I did wrong, say, well, this is how you should do it from now on. Let's see if we can help you. Mm -hmm. That should be the mindset is I'm here to help, not I'm here to hinder you. Because... <laughs> Society only runs if everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing and helping each other. 
-hmm. If we're all biting each other and, and, and ruining everybody, it's going to destroy all of society. So it's called a public servant because they're supposed to be serving you because we pay them, right? We pay yes. for their... Yeah. So people need to understand that. So I thought that was an interesting thing there that that if somebody comes to your house or whatever, you have, well, would you fill out this questionnaire? Because yeah. I'd like to educate on, this is the law right here. Yeah. And, you know, are you going to follow the law? You, you're asking me to. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. What Thank else you. do you got for us? In the well, book? I was going to add to that. So there's three pages here if you're just a public servant. If you're healthcare related, you take the three pages or you walk through the three pages. And then you, because you're special, <laughs> you get four more pages of what's called the healthcare provider addendum. Mm. And that really goes into chapter and verse on all these different elements of our rights as citizens uh, and bright legal lines that they should never cross. Mm -hmm. uh, requirements for them in terms of their expertise, their level of specific training on whatever is involved that day. Mm -hmm. And it, kind of back to your point, Robert, I think uh, a really lovely outcome from these, uh, hopefully for a lot of people coming and knocking on doors, they just don't, the public servant just doesn't know any better. They, in fact, many of them, I suspect, think they're doing a public good, but mm -hmm. walking them through these, I think can possibly really open their eyes in terms of the astounding risk they're at of, of, of doing something that's incredibly illegal mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and puts them at tremendous jeopardy legally speaking, mm -hmm. for, for doing these things they ought not be doing, and hopefully, uh, to the point of, of Stuart Crane, winning them over to right. the side of the, the people they visit right. to say, I shouldn't be doing this. And the laws are on the books. We should all follow the laws that are on the books, not make them up as we go. Mm -hmm. And we have seen that the last two years in what they call a mandate. Mm -hmm. And we went ahead and we bought, do you remember the name of it? Black's, Black's Law Dictionary. It was $120. And in all around America and well around the world, they said it's a mandate. You have to do this. It's a mandate. You have to do that. It's a mandate. And so you've got governors, you've got mayors you, putting out a mandate. Mm -hmm. Well, Black's Law Dictionary says a mandate is when both parties agree. If one party does not agree, guess what? It's not binding. It's only legally binding when you say, okay, I choose to accept that and I'll follow that. So you have every right to say, no. <laughs> and that's part of choice. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of your liberals, I'm pro-choice. Okay. How come you're pro-choice in one thing, not pro-choice in another? Wouldn't you be completely pro-choice? I mean, don't you want to be, um, what's the word person to be the same in everything and, and not hypocritical mm -hmm. and I'm for this, but I'm not for that. What is that? A consistent. Don't you want to be consistent? Mm -hmm. So, uh, choice is important. And I believe in the choosing of do I choose to follow that mandate? Or if I don't, then you can't legally bind that on me. And so a lot of people have been duped, unfortunately. A lot of people mm -hmm. just give in to mandates. And we're seeing that to this day. A lot of people have become blind followers mm -hmm. in, instead of empowered people who are strong and know their rights. Mm -hmm. And I wish they would uh, know the rights because we have rights that were given us by God according to our Constitution. And every one of our people that's elected in this country, they swear an oath to that. Mm -hmm. So why don't they keep it? And who's going to hold them accountable? Yeah. And, that's the question. I think it's becoming really clear to me, Robert, that it falls to all of us. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that I think we've been lulled to sleep about is, oh, that's someone else's job, right? To, to yeah. look after my kids' well-being or their, their, their teaching or the safety of my neighborhood. You know, oh, that's the police's job. Well, no, it's... I mean, yes, the police play a role, but it's all our jobs. And and part of, I think, the it pains me to say this, but the tremendous success by those who would do us harm over the last couple of years is because we've been so lulled to sleep that it's all everyone else, someone else's job, mm -hmm. that, that we yeah. have uh, abrogated our response, not only our right, but our right. responsibility to be active citizens, to be aware of what's going right. on, to understand our rights, understand the law, and to hold the office holders accountable mm -hmm. when they overstep because they are they are overstepping wildly uh, yeah. in this season that we find I wasn't going to talk about this, but when it comes to voting, you know, a lot of people I know that are Christians say, "Well, we don't vote. We, you know, you know, we, 
Well, part of your duty in life is a civic duty. To my grandpa always said, the reason you vote is to vote, vote the bums out. That's what he said. <laughs> and so his idea was not, I'm voting for someone. I am putting my voice out there that I disapprove of what they're doing because mm -hmm. they're doing wrong. So please vote and vote against the evil mm -hmm. because um, you have the opportunity, you have the right, and just doing nothing is, is basically saying, no, it's okay. It's okay that it keeps going on. Mm -hmm. I think, no, let's go out. Now people say, well, do they count it? Well, I'm not going there. I'm just saying to me, I sleep at night knowing that I voted against the evil that I see. Mm -hmm. And maybe nothing came of it, but at least they knew by voice, that there's mm -hmm. a lot of people out there that are like, we don't want this Luciferian agenda. Mm -hmm. We don't want this globalist uh, great reset. Mm -hmm. We don't want our money being less valuable and things like that. We, we don't want this. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing is bullies. I don't like bullies. I never have. Mm -hmm. But the world is being taken over by bullies, and it's a shame. So we've looked at a lot of things as far as important into the world scenario, mm -hmm. like before the rapture, into the world, got to need this, but even after the rapture and the tribulation, things that people need. So what exactly, you know, we looked at water, food, things like that. Mm -hmm. What exactly is the most important thing mm -hmm. and where was that in your book? Okay. So let's go there. Um, so in section four, it is talking about a lot of different elements of, of preparation. And section 414, this book really isn't, if you're looking for a 101 on just kind of a checklist of stuff to buy, this really isn't your book. There's so many, there's so much on that. There's so many preppers who have been at this since I was, uh, you know, a teenager mm -hmm. that um, I, it would have been redundant for me to go do that. I did feel compelled for those who were just newborn babes to the whole concept of, of being prepared, I didn't want to leave it out. And so let me talk about, let me use this opportunity. So in section 414, page 63, it says physical supplies. It's a listing, and I listed them in my opinion of importance, uh, things you had to have. We already talked about water. Um, we've talked about uh, Second Amendment implements and, uh, and the criticality of that. Because listen, if, if you're not prepared to defend, you're simply saving up for others to come and take your stuff. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's, uh, it's imperative. It, to say it's imperative is an understatement. Uh, ammunition obviously goes with that. Food goes without saying. Shelter is incredibly important, not only having shelter, but where is your shelter to be where others are not, the, the others that you're not going to want to be around. Um, tools, a lot of people forget about tools, and tools are incredibly important, particularly when things break, you can't go down to the market like your dad got in the habit of doing. It's not going to be there to get. Training, you can train for stuff now. You, mm -hmm. you, you can equip yourself with training now. Communications, we already talked about that as a force multiplier. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it is one of the biggest. In fact, uh, talking to one particular uh, former Marine from Vietnam, he said the most terrifying experience he had in Vietnam was not getting shot at, it was being cut off from communications. Mm. And, and it haunted him. Wow. Uh, and then relationships. And we talked about teams, about groups, and how Rambo will do versus a well-fortified, um, inter-trusting team of people, whether you call it a team, a community, what a neighborhood, what have you. But all of those things pale in comparison to God. And we talked about hope uh, and how it's one of the rules of three. You survive three months without hope. For what's coming, uh, I'm utterly convinced because I, I've found myself wondering, why God? <laughs> why, why God does it have to get so bad? And why does it have to even get so bad comparatively, compared to former times, for your children, your church, leading up to the rapture? And I'm utterly convinced that what God is doing, and this is my opinion, this isn't thus saith the Lord, but God is removing that comfortable middle ground that I used to live in. Hmm. I live there. The lukewarm. Yes, where, where I, I was a hypocrite. I had one foot in God's camp. I knew Jesus was real. I knew he was the answer, but I liked the salvation part, but I didn't like the lordship part. And so I played the hypocrite for decades in my life. No more. And, and so I think it's one of the most loving things that God could do is remove that comfortable middle 
where people can put it off, where people can be hypocritical, where people can pretend to themselves that, yes, I'm a Christian, but there's no fruit in their life and there's no there's there's inauthenticity permeating their walk. He's, I think it's one of the most loving things he'll ever do is get rid of that soft middle. He's forcing people to choose. I mean, you're either going to choose the world, you're going to choose Satan, you're going to choose the beast system, or by golly, you're going to choose God, you're going to put your faith in Jesus, and you're going to walk this out in His strength, in the power of His might, as you read in Ephesians 6.10, because we're reaching a season where people listening to this you're going to be forced to choose and you 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 must choose God through his son Jesus Christ. He paid the price for you. Did he did he not die a horrible enough death for you to to be faithful to him? So put your trust in God through his son Jesus and then be the hero of your story as you walk it out faithfully to God. Um, where you can hear from the Lord himself, well done, good and faithful servant, because this is the time when our actions, our words, our faithfulness, our boldness with our testimony, with the gospel is going to count the most. Because as God gets rid of that soft middle of hypocrisy and delay and uh, uh, procrastination in coming to faith, People are going to be hungry. People are hungry for the truth. People are going to be hungry for the gospel. And you've got the gospel. You share it boldly and um, and uh, be true to that verse in Daniel that said, but they that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Mm-hmm. And this is the only time you can get rewards. Afterwards, it'll be too late. So it's an opportunity. Mm-hmm. It, always look at it as opportunity. Mm-hmm. And there's an opportunity now for a later opportunity. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this is how to be strong now to help you be strong later. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people though, they're weak now, they will be weak for all eternity. Isn't that sad? So Mm -hmm. be strong. That's what we need to do. So Amen. amen, amen. Anything else? That's about it, brother. Okay. <laughs> wow. Thanks for being with us, guys. Glad you came along with us. And uh, John, thank you for writing the book and telling us about the book, Nehemiah Strong. Tell everybody where to get that book from, if you would. Absolutely. So if you'd like a copy of Nehemiah Strong for yourself, go to johndislin.com. That's D-Y-S-L-I-N.com, johndislin.com. And if you use the discount code BREAKER1, you save 10%. Uh, We'd love for you to check out Nehemiah Strong. Come learn more at the website and see if it's for you. But thank you in advance for your your interest. All right. See you all later. God bless. Bye, everybody. (laughs) <laughs> no, you, you went too low. You gotta, you gotta go. I gotta let's, try. Hey, let's go low. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that was too easy. But high five for real. Put it all okay. over. Okay. High yeah. five. Let's do a high five. <laughs> I can't read. <laughs> yeah. See, now that's cool. <laughs>